Welcome to whiskey.com, where fine spirits meet. My name is Lüning, Horst Lüning, I'm the master taste of whiskey.com, and today we have the FAQs number six. And to these FAQs, I have two bottles here on my cask, and uh, well, they are responsible for the two questions. And uh, the first one is Highland Park. Highland Park, 12 years old, and since a few months, there is there are rumors in the community that this whiskey is colored nowadays. So Highland Park switched from uncolored to colored, and that is impossible. Well, I can tell you this whiskey is of course not colored. There is some regulation on the continent in Germany and Denmark, and those regulation Regulations tell that you have to add the coloring on, the, on your back label. You have to say this whiskey is colored uh, with sugar caramel. Yeah. Uh, if not, well, you have a problem as a dealer. Uh, because uh, the dealer is responsible for the exact uh, writings on the label. Not the producer, the dealer. Wrong word. So the small dealer is responsible and not the big producer who knows what's going on. And in Germany there is a... Well, there, there are bottles on the market where unknowledgeable people have added a sticker on the back telling this whiskey contains sugar caramel. This resulted out of of fear. Well, we have a very strong administration in Germany and hefty calls to order, costly written warnings. And so people have this, well, this fear and add uh, those stickers to the bottles and that's not true. Why? Well, because the producer, producers do not act offensively enough. They could write on their label without artificial coloring. This was, would solve all problems. But no, there's nothing sad about color here on the bottle. And there is some... Uh, here's the, the tube. Uh, There's some vague uh, saying about only natural and so on, but it's not said uncolored. So the problem is uh, that bureaucracy is so strong that people fear bureaucracy and so they add wrong things on the label. Well, you're not sentenced if you write the wrong coloring on a bottle. No. You're sentenced if you omit it, and you were wrong. <laughs> it's sheer fear. Um, I called the distributor, no, I sent him a, writ, uh, a written notice asking if it's colored or not, and this is quite a huge, a big company, uh, and there he returned and said, no, it's not colored. So this is the official saying, Highland Park, 12 years old, is not colored. No Highland Park is colored. This is important because those rumors spread in the community. Uh, and this is not good for Highland Park. So Highland Park is a good one, it's not coloring. Uh, if you have a look at the second bottle here, this is a bottle for the European market. And uh, they say on the back, uh, for Germany, mit Farbstoff Zuckerkulle for Denmark Farbstoff Caramel Poland Kamel Zwiers no, very small writing Caramel so there are a few countries which require the coloring statement on the back and for other uh, countries not Italy Portugal Greek, so a lot is 
told on the back. So this is a European label for all Europeans. And in former times, there had been like a woolens on the market uh, where nothing was said on the back. But those bottles were colored as well. There are huge vats, vessels in which the 43% ABV is mixed. And from there it goes into the bottle, always, always the same bottle. And in the end, on the uh, labeling machine, on the bottling line, then they decide which to put on the bottle. There are no two different bottlings of Lagavulin uh, for different countries. No. It's just the labeling. And this is important to know. Uh, so there are bottles on the market uh, which are uh, indicated perfectly and others not. Yeah, there is a new regulation, European regulation coming up. Um, and from 2016 on, there will be more regulation for the backside of bottles uh, telling people uh, there is so much uh, calories in it and proteins and, and carbon hydrates and salt and so on and everything, every, every number is zero, 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 just the calories out of alcohol. So you could omit that, but no, the regulation will come and you can already see some uh, bottles from, from huge corporations which add those uh, numbers in advance to these upcoming regulations. Uh, it's called anticipatory obedience. Yes, I looked that word up. <laughs> it's not in my active language. Um, Second question. Second question this time was uh, risen in our forum on whiskey.com and there uh, it was asked, well, I bought an Artback 10 lately and this bottle is no longer that good as it was before. And I'm asked these questions not every week, no, but more than once in a month saying the bottle is not as good as before, as well for the Lagavulin. So therefore, I placed the bottle here. I had no Arpeg 10 uh, available in the moment. Um, most connoisseurs came from mediocre blended scotch whiskies which were available in huge amounts on the market. The quality was limited. Mediocre is a too good word. No, they were just bad blends and then in the mid-90s uh, single malt whiskey began its boom and then you were lucky to find a bottle of Artback 10 in, from 1999 on or from, from Lagavulin 16 somewhere on a shelf and this was a, well, it was so incredible good, so far away from the standard blends, you couldn't believe that. So this was heaven, really. And the rest was hell? No, no not really. Uh, and from that time on, you decided to start your journey and have other extremely good tasting single malt whiskies. Macallan 12, uh, Glenmorangie Portwood Finish, the first one. Uh, there are so many very, very good single malt whiskies on the market, Highland Park, of course, uh, Beaumont, and so on, and so on. And you, you went from one heaven to the other heaven, and everything was so wonderful. And then, oh, the first bad one was in between. Yeah, bad luck. Uh, better look out next time. So your journey went on and went on, and most of the single malt whiskey lovers consume 
no more than four or five bottles in a year. So you have four or five bottles open in your cupboard, in your bar, and uh, these bottles, well, if they reduce in level and they are empty, then you replace it by a new one. You said, well, I had that, I had that. The next logical step, a friend told me, and this is the next one. Glamorangy, 18 years. And you move forward and you move forward and after tens of years, after decades, you say, well, the first, the beginning was the Artback 10, was the Lagerwood in 16. Let's have another one. Let's go back to heaven. The first one. You buy it and as I told, people say, it's not that good. Why is this so normal? So the brain of the human being uh, has to forget bad things. Otherwise you would collect rubbish in your head and uh, get traumas and so on. So you have to reduce bad thoughts over the years. The good old times when everything was worse. So the good old times is there's no <laughs> uh, misleading sentence like that one. The good old times. In good old times what we found in whiskey bottles decades ago was incredible. So with the modern bottling lines where computers look into every single bottle. All this rubbish is gone from the bottles. Every cask has a uh, has an history. What was in before, when was it built, uh, which type of wood and and and. So you know when the cask is empty, when there is no uh, no longer good taste to give to the whiskey in the staves of the cask any longer. So uh, today the production capabilities and the quality assurance is so much better than, than before. But people tend to think, well, in former times there had been a man working on that and today just computers. Ah, rubbish. Uh, no, <laughs> probably the man had a, a long weekend and in the morning <laughs> he forgot that those casks was for dumping and those were the new casks so he filled all the old ones <laughs> again and then uh, the master distiller, uh, the, the distillery manager said, oh, incredible, you did the wrong thing, Yeah, just leave it in, we have no time, we have to work. So, and there were bad casks refilled and good ones forgotten. Everything happened and today quality assurance is really, really high. So the quality differences between new bottles and the old ones is not that big. I would not put my hands in a fire for all of those bottles. There might be some black sheep in between those who, well, bring out cheap whiskey in a mimicry bottle which was excellent in former times. Well, might be, but for most of the bottles, no, that's not true. Um, I would suggest that you move forward and look at the old bottles, at your old experience, and uh, if you celebrate an old bottle, try to remember the good whiskey and then your brain will function the right way that this whiskey will be better than that which is in. Because all the bad remembrance, well, you had a, quite a headache after those first bottles, haven't you? Uh, so uh, that you now remember uh, only the good things of this bottle. Um, third question. What's a virgin oak? Virgin oak? 
Um, let's have a look how casks are made. Casks are made from fresh oak, uh, well, dried fresh oak, and then they are uh, heated from the inside to 150 degrees centigrade or 300 Fahrenheit. And with this temperature, uh, the cellulose is converted into sugars, wood sugars. So oak is made out of cellulose and lignin, which is the hardening compound inside the oak. Uh, if you have hardwood, then you have lignin in amount of 35% in the structure. If you have softwood, then it's less 20. I have no detailed figures for that. But the lignin is quite high, so it's harder than the others. Um, and then you receive those sugars, and those sugars are caramelized by the heat uh, into caramel. And this is the caramel you taste in a good whiskey. And the lignin is converted into vanillin. They are uh, chemically related to each other. Um, so in a good bourbon, which is always produced in new fresh casks, we have this high vanillin and uh, caramel taste. Um, well, there are ten thousands of other compounds <laughs> produced and converted as well, but uh, those two they are well quite straightforward to remember. Um, after this first treatment, the so-called toasting, uh, the casks are burned with a high flame, so that there is a charcoal layer resulting in on the inside. Uh, there are different grades and thickness, and this charcoal layer is for filtering strong and sharp aromas out of the raw whiskey. Um, and then the cask is called virgin. And if you put Scotch whiskey in such a virgin cask, then the taste is, well, quite weird for a Scotch, because there are substances in the Scotch now which you t typically do not find in, because Scotch lives from a longer maturation period uh, where the, the character of the raw whiskey changes and uh, matures and from the cask walls uh, the taste is uh, torn into the whiskey and uh, this is called additional maturation and the other is subtractive maturation. Um, and because the maturation period of scotch is typically quite long, or should be quite long, uh, you can't stay this extremely oaky taste, which would reduce a uh, result from a, a virgin oak cask. But there are a lot of scotch whiskies maturing in the warehouses in old casks, which have been filled and filled before. So re re refilled casks. And the result out of those casks is quite light. It's like white wine. And uh, so is the taste of oak missing in these whiskies. So they do not really taste like whiskies. Um, and those whiskies from refilled casks are then transferred for finishing in virgin casks, just for a short time. And this short time kicks in the oakiness, and there are two whiskies. I think I had both already here in my cask, the uh, Deanston Virgin Oak and the Ockentoshan American Oak, I think it's called, I'm not quite sure, uh, where they use those virgin casks, uh, I think as from the beginning. And there is a little dispute between those distilleries, which one was uh, first on the market, which was the first uh, virgin oak. So uh, I cannot tell you which one was the first, and I read about uh, virgin oak casks at uh, Bunahaven also, 
Um, but very often those virgin oak casks were used for, uh, for finishing, for giving a little bit more into the, well, quite ready whiskey. Um, and then there are those casks called rejuvenated casks. There you have old casks used for maturation for decades. And then uh, you have a steel brush and the machine and you, uh, lo uh, you, you grind off the inside uh, of the cask until the fresh oak is visible. Then you toast it again at 150 degrees centigrade, 300 Fahrenheit, uh, and now the, the leftover fresh oak or unconverted oak is uh, cut into uh, sugars and caramelized as well, and the lignin into vanillin, and all those 10,000 compounds is going on, and because today those cars are no longer rolled on the floor, uh, are no longer pushed down uh, from a lorry to the floor, but uh, they are, or they most often are on on pallets and uh, are moved by forklifts. Uh, so you can lose a third or a half of the thickness of the staves, and the cask will still be stable enough to carry the whiskey. So those casks are the rejuvenated casks. They are quite popular today. There are uh, some uh, cooperages owned by huge corporations, which con changed over to uh, rejuvenating casks instead of, uh, well, fixing casks, just fixing casks. So they rejuvenate them already. Uh, and I've seen that at Loch Lomond, Alexandria. Um, and those casks, well, might be very, very old. If you have a cask used for 30, 40 years, then you rejuvenate it, and then you go for another 30 to 40 years, you, you end up at 70, 80 years from a cask. Wow, oh, the good old times when everything was good. Yeah, that's it. Um, if you would like to ask questions, please do so on all our social media, in our forum, in our vlog, uh, wherever you'd like, and please add a hashtag whiskey.com without the dots. So I'm looking at whiskey.com and I'm searching for the, well, questions. Uh, I'm able to tell you something about them. Um, not everything, I'm not knowing everything. So, uh, and the questions are becoming more and more. So don't be too unhappy uh, if I am not able to answer your question. Thank you very much for watching.